Good evening and welcome to So You Want to Be a CPA. This is a joint webcast between the California Society of CPAs and the California Board of Accountancy. And I also want to welcome Roger CPA Review for their um, contributions to this uh, program as well concerning the CPA exam. Uh, like I said, this is a joint webcast and we're excited to have uh, the Board of Accountancy come and, and answer your questions uh, about this, the CPA licensure process uh, as well as um, we'll be hearing from um, the Sacramento chapter vice president as also a uh, person who's just recently been uh, taking the CPA exam, uh, Joanna McAvoy. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is David Lowe. I'm the strategic relations manager for the California Society of CPAs. And part of my job is to oversee our student initiatives. So we're, we're very grateful to have this opportunity to work with the Board of County on these series of webcasts. Uh, please note that this will be recorded and um, uploaded to YouTube uh, at, at a later date. So um, please um, uh, take advantage of that and, and uh, have that uh, replayed at, at your earliest convenience as well. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Cal CPA Sacramento Chapter Vice President uh, Bridget Sander, CPA, uh, where she'll uh, kind of talk about uh, herself and to kind of her career uh, path and a little bit about the Sacramento Chapter. So I'll turn it over to Bridget. Thank you, David. Um, again, my name is Bridget Sanders. I am a CPA and Vice President of the Sacramento Chapter of the California Society of CPAs. I want to extend a warm welcome to all of those participating in the event this evening. We hope you enjoy the exciting program we have lined up for you. Before we begin, uh, I want to share with you a bit about my professional journey and how my experience with Cal CPA has played a significant role in both my personal and professional development over the past eight years. I have loved accounting since I took my first class as a junior in high school and knew relatively early on that I wanted to pursue a career in this field. While in college, I was advised to gain experience through internship opportunities, which allowed me to test drive a few career paths before graduating. My second internship, which transitioned into my first job after college, landed me in public accounting, where I went full steam ahead on the CPA track. Having my CPA license has provided so many opportunities over my 20-year career. Of course, most importantly, I met my husband at the beginning of my career while we both worked as auditors pursuing our CPA licenses. There, have been many paths, there are many paths available to accounting professionals, and needless to say, I have tried my hand at a few of them. I went from auditor to senior financial analyst to financial reporting manager to forensic accountant to business owner and now on to CFO, and I may not be finished yet. While I became a California CPA long ago, I worked for a few years on the East Coast, but moved back to California in 2008. As a side note, it was my CPA husband's virtual job in private industry that allowed us to relocate to Sacramento so our daughter could grow up closer to family. I joined a local accounting firm and being new to the area, wanted to become connected with others in the Sacramento business community. The firm leaders suggested that I become involved with the Sacramento chapter of Cal CPA. I took their advice and have been an active member of our chapter ever since. I have been a director on the board since 2009 and assumed an officer position last year. While working as a consultant practicing forensic accounting and litigation support, I found great benefit in chairing our forensic services committee for four years. I also recently served as co-chair of a new group in Sacramento called the GOLD Committee. GOLD stands for Growth Opportunities in Leadership Development, and the committee's goal is to provide quality continuing education in the area of leadership. One of the main reasons that I personally remain involved in Cal CPA is to promote the profession to the next generation of accountants and future CPAs. The proceeds from all of our events are used to provide scholarships to deserving students. In addition to being active on local college campuses, we host an annual luncheon at Sacramento State University, which allows accounting students to hear from practitioners working in various aspects of the profession. This year's student outreach luncheon will be held on November 10th and is open to all students in the area free of charge. Our Young and Emerging Professional Committee, or YEPS, also help acclimate and provide support to new professionals entering the business world. The next Sacramento YEP event, a volunteer day at the Ronald McDonald House, is scheduled from 9.30 a.m. to noon on November 12th. 
Our chapter also hosts networking events, such as the ABC Mixer and our annual golf tournament. We host an annual chapter-wide event, which features presentations on global topics, as well as the opportunity to network with other professionals. If you are looking to connect and learn from others in a specific field, we have various committees that host monthly or bi-monthly meetings, tax, real estate, estate and financial planning, nonprofit, audit, and governmental accounting. Our chapter also believes it is important to support our local community. Our next chapter-wide community event will be held on November 3rd from 4 to 7 p.m. where we will serve at the Sacramento Food Bank. Cal CPA really offers something for everyone. Student membership in Cal CPA is free, as well as the first year of candidate membership. I want to thank you again for participating in our event this evening. And without further ado, I will pass you back to David for speaker introductions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bridget. Uh, before we get to the Board of Accountancy, I'd like to um, also mention that we will have an opportunity for Q&A. Uh, at the conclusion of uh, our presentation. So uh, we invite the audience uh, to go ahead and type in their questions, and we'll go ahead and get to as many questions as we can um, following our, our, our presentations. So um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Suzanne Gracia from the California Board of Accountancy, and uh, she's going to go ahead and walk us through uh, the licensure process. Um, and uh, they'll be uh, presenting uh, a, web, uh, a bunch of websites, actually, that are going to be um, shown to you on screen. And they'll go ahead and navigate that, that website. Um, so I'll go ahead and turn over to Suzanne right now. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Suzanne Gracia, and I'm the examination unit coordinator at the CBA. Uh, this evening, I will be going over the CPA examination application process for you. The exam application is a national four-part computer-based exam that will test the basic skills and competencies necessary for entry into the practice of public accountancy. The CPA exam is a collaborative process between the various state boards of accountancy, the National State Board of Accountancy, also known as NASBA, the American Institute of CPAs, or AICPA, and Prometric. Each group maintains specific roles in ensuring the validity and security of the CPA exam. The state boards of accountancy, which includes the CBA, are responsible for establishing the minimum qualifications to sit for the CPA exam. NASBA acts as a central clearinghouse where all state boards of accountancy submit information on eligible candidates, receive exam scores, and where you will pay the required testing fees. The AICPA primary has primary responsibility for the development, scoring, and analysis of the CPA exam. Prometric is responsible for offering the testing centers at which you will take the CPA exam and maintains over 8,000 test centers in over 160 countries, 17 of which are in California. Prior to, the exam, prior to applying for the CPA exam, we recommend that you request your official transcripts. It is important to remember that official transcripts must be mailed directly to the CBA office from the college. The CBA cannot accept unofficial transcripts or transcripts issued to or mailed by a student. A couple of tips about requesting transcripts to minimize the delay in processing your application is first, it may take up to two weeks from the time you place your request with the college until the CBA receives the transcript in our office. Second, if you're a recent graduate, you may need to wait a short time after graduation to request your transcripts to ensure that the college has posted the conferral of your degree on the transcript. We commonly send notifications of deficiencies to CPA exam applicants because the transcript we received did not have the conferral of the degree posted. Last and probably most important, if you, if you attended multiple institutions, it is in your best interest to request transcripts from each, each institution. Oftentimes, transfer units are listed in lump sum totals on other institutions' transcripts and do not provide the necessary class-by-class -class breakdown to assess if certain courses qualify towards meeting the minimum educational qualifications. 
For those of you that may have completed education outside of the U.S., you will need to have your education evaluated by one of the CBA approved foreign evaluation credentials evaluation services. Once these services complete their evaluation, they will send it directly to the CBA for review. When you are ready to apply for the CPA exam, the CBA maintains an easy to use online application, though if you prefer, you can request a paper copy. You can access the online application under the applicants tab from our homepage. It will direct you to an initial information page where you can establish a new account or access your existing account. Establishing an account is simple. You will need to provide your full name as shown on your valid ID and date of birth, as well as create a username and provide your email address. Once you have completed this step, you will receive an email with a temporary password and instructions on changing the password. Once you have completed these steps, you will be able to log into your account to provide detailed contact information and educational information. You can also indicate any special accommodations you may need in relation to disability or other medical need in the additional info tab. After you complete your application, you will be able to create an application remittance form. Simply print, sign, and submit the form with your first time application fee to the CBA. Presently, the CBA does not accept online payment methods, so you will need to submit a check, cashier's check, or a money order. Once we have received your application remittance form, application fee, and transcripts, we will perform an evaluation of your qualifications to sit for the CPA exam. To qualify for the CPA exam, you must have a bachelor's degree or higher and completed a minimum of 24 semester units each in accounting and business related subjects. Our average processing time for a fully completed application is 30 days. Once we've completed our review, we will notify you of the outcome. If you have met the uh, minimum qualifications, we will send you an automated email to the email account on file that will provide instructions on the next steps in the testing process. If you do not meet the minimum qualifications, we will send you a letter in the mail. The letter will detail the deficiency or deficiencies that we identified and a copy of all of the evaluated transcripts we have on file. The evaluated transcripts will provide you with information on those courses we deem to apply to the accounting subjects and those we deem to apply to the business related subjects. If after reviewing your transcripts, you believe an error was made, you are welcome to provide documentation to the CBA which you believe demonstrates that a particular course met one of the core subject requirements. Your application will remain open for one year from the date it was approved or deemed deficient. During this one year window, you will need to either select the sections you wish to test for or remedy any outstanding deficiencies. If a year passes and you have not made a section selection or remedied the outstanding deficiencies, your application is abandoned and fee is forfeited. The CBA will keep all of, your all of your transcripts on file, but you will need to submit a new application remittance form and application fee. Once the CBA has approved your application for the CPA exam, your next step will be selecting which sections of the exam you are going to take. You do this by logging into your client account and selecting the section or sections that you want to sit for for the next nine calendar months. While the CPA, CPA exam is given year round, there are four windows with which you can test. These windows are January, February, April, May, July, August, and October, November. During the other four months, March, June, September, and December, the CPA exam is closed to testing. With that said, I would like to mention that due to the next version of the CPA exam scheduled to launch on April 1st, 2017, the testing dates have been extended 10 days for each testing window. For example, 
The October-November window will be extended through December 10th, and the January-February window will be extended through March 10th. However, the 10-day extension will not be available during June 2017, as additional time will be required to analyze exam results and set new passing scores following the launch of the new exam in April. Meacher Wilson will be discussing the next version of the CPA exam in more detail momentarily. So back to selecting a section. While you are in your client account to select your sections, you are welcome to select only one section or all four sections, but you may only sit for each section for one once per testing window. When selecting how many sections you wish to test for during the next nine calendar months, you should take into consideration your work schedule, available study time, and personal commitments because the section fees you pay to NASBA are non-refundable. After you make your section selection, the CBA will transmit your approval to C and CPA exam section selections to NASBA. Within a few business days, you will receive a payment coupon via email. You will have 90 days to pay the fees for the selected sections. After you pay your fees to NASBA, you will receive a notice to schedule, commonly referred to as an NTS. When you receive your NTS, you should review it thoroughly to ensure that the spelling of your name matches exactly the spelling of your name on the valid identification cards you intend on bringing with you to the testing center. Any discrepancies could result in you being denied entrance to the exam and result in forfeiture of all associated fees. Once you have your NTS, you have nine months from the date on your NTS to schedule your sections. If the NTS expires, you, are for, you will forfeit all paid fees. You have two easy options to schedule your sections. You can either go online to Prometric's online scheduling tool or directly contact Prometric by telephone. On the day of your scheduled exam, it is recommended that you show up about 30 to 45 minutes prior to your appointment. This will allow you time to locate the office, find parking, and complete the check-in process. On testing day, do not, and I emphasize this enough, do not forget your NTS and valid forms of ID. Without these, you will not be allowed to test and will forfeit all paid testing fees. NASBA publishes the anticipated score release dates on its website twice a year, generally in January and July. The AICPA releases exam scores to NASBA in four waves throughout each testing window. Once NASBA releases the scores to the CBA, we will post them in your client account. You can find your scores in your client account under the status tab. We do not release score information via email or telephone. Along with your score, you will receive a candidate diagnostic performance report that will provide you with your performance in comparison with individuals that pass the exam. To pass a particular section, you must have a passing rate of 75. Once you have passed a particular section, you will receive conditional credit status for that section that lasts 18 months. You must establish credit in all four parts within that 18 month period to pass the CPA exam. If credit status expires for any, given re for any given section prior to your successful passage of the CPA exam, you will need to retake that section. Once you have passed the CPA exam, you will receive a congratulatory letter in the mail, which will include information on applying for the CPA license. Once you have passed the CPA exam as a California candidate, your scores never expire. When you begin to plan for the CPA exam, we want you to know that you're not going at it alone. There is a wealth of information available to you that will assist you in understanding your requirements to qualify and will assist you in preparing for and taking the CPA exam. Everything you need to know about qualifying for the CPA exam in California is available on our website. In our exam applicants section, you will find the online application a link to various forms, and most importantly, the Uniform CPA Examination Handbook. This handbook will walk you through in far greater detail 
everything I just went over and will answer many of your questions you will have qualifying and sitting for the CP exam as a California candidate. I encourage all of you to review and become familiar with it. Additionally, the CBA maintains a series of frequently asked questions that will assist you in understanding the requirements to qualify for licensure. If at any time during your application and scheduling process we can be of any assistance, we have dedicated staff available to assist you by telephone or email. You can find our contact information on our website. As for preparing for the CPA exam, the AICPA's website provides an abundance of information related to the exam including an examination overview, information on content and scoring, a newsletter, a tutorial and sample test, and the list goes on. That concludes my presentation on the CBA's examination process. At this time, I would like to turn it back to Mr. David Lowe. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne, for that information. Um, now we're going to uh, turn it over to Mitra Wilson from Rogers CPA Re Review. And uh, as Suzanne has mentioned, uh, there's going to be a new CPA exam uh, version that's going to be coming out uh, on April 1st, 2017. And uh, Mitra is going to go ahead and, and dive into that. And um, we've got a lot of questions here at Cal CPA regarding the exam. Uh, I'm sure Mitra has as well. So uh, she's going to hopefully dispel a lot of fear, a lot of rumors uh, with her expertise. So I'm going to turn it over to Mitra. Okay, thanks, David. Hi, everyone. Um, like David said, my name is Mitra Wilson. I am the Director of Strategic Alliances with Rogers CPA Review. I'm very excited to be here. Hopefully, everyone can see my PowerPoint slides. Um, I'm really just going to dive into the big changes that are happening just around the corner. As Suzanne mentioned, um, they are official starting April 1st of 2017. It's a hot topic. Um, and if you are able to take a couple parts at least before the big changes happen, we here at Roger CP Review highly recommend you get some out of the way. Um, now I'm just going to give a snapshot. I'm happy to answer questions uh, towards the end. But do know that uh, we're collaborating with Cal CPA to offer a more thorough presentation on this topic in mid-November. So keep your eye out for that. Uh, but to start off, as you can see with this first slide, you know, why is the exam even changing in the first place? That's a big question that a lot of people are asking. And really, it has to do with firm's expectations of newly licensed CPAs to demonstrate a higher order skill set. So if you think about it, a lot of what incoming new hires at a public accounting firm uh, used to be expected to do 10 years ago have now been replaced by advanced software. So firms are really saying, you know, we really want more critical thinking skills. We want a higher order, uh, a higher level of thinking with our brand new hires. So that's why the exam is changing. And it's a really positive change, actually, because it'll maintain the public's trust in a CPA's judgment and understanding of accounting standards. Moving on to the second slide, um, really what this all means is that the exam is going to go away from a high emphasis on remembering and understanding, which is generally through multiple choice questions, and move up, as you can see the arrow, towards more analysis and evaluation type questions. So currently the CP exam is a fun-filled 14-hour experience. Um, as you can see on this slide, uh, audit and FAR or financial accounting and reporting are each four hours in length. And then BEC, which stands for business environment and concepts and reg or regulation are three hours. So that's the current format, and you can just take it part by part. You don't have to take all of them at once. Uh, so that's the good news there. Now, you know, coming into the future in quarter two of 2017, you will see that BEC and regulation are actually going to go up an hour each. So in the future, it'll be a lovely 16 hour testing experience. 
Um, again, the good news is you have 18 months to complete the whole thing. So we recommend that you study for a part and you take a part, study for a part, take a part and do it that way. But you can really pace it um, to however you want. You can take it in as little as time as you want. Um, you, you technically could take all four parts in one testing window. Um, and then many people space it out and take the full 12 to 18 months. So with the changes coming up, <clears throat> you can see that audit FAR and reg currently are made up of 60% multiple choice questions and 40% TBSs. TBS stands for task-based simulation. And those are questions that simulate real world experiences if you're at an accounting firm. So they often involve some kind of research function or maybe a tax form that you have to fill out. So very practical type questions um, and they're much longer form type questions. In Q2 of 2017, you'll see that it'll be 50% multiple choice questions and 50% TBSs, so completely even. That's a big change there. For BEC, it's currently made up of 85% multiple choice questions and 15% written communication. So that WC stands for written communication, um, and that's really made up of three essays that you will have to complete. In the future, it'll be made up of 50% multiple choice questions, 35% task-based simulations, and then still that 15% of your grade goes towards those essays. So that's the big change there is BEC up to this point never had task-based simulations but in the future it will. So it does seem to be the section that is going to be changing the most. Now, a lot of people ask me, you know, Mitra, you know, strategy wise, what order should I take the CPA exam? And if you find yourself kind of on the cusp where you'll be able to take some in 2016 and some once the changes hit in 2017, you may want to consider taking BEC or even maybe regulation earlier than later, just because those are the two parts that will be changing the most. But again, it's totally up to you. Everyone's different and you have to do what's best for you. So moving on with this taking away of just the straight up memorization type questions, the remembering and understanding and adding the critical thinking that has really changed the structure of the exam. So you can see that currently the uh, all four sections of the CP exam are made up of three testlets of multiple choice questions. And then the final testlet is where you'll see those TBSs, or in the case of BEC, the written communication. In Q2 of 2017, the big change is you will only get two testlets of multiple choice questions uh, for all four sections. And then the next three testlets will be made up of task-based simulations, um, except for BEC, that last one will be the written communication. Now, there already have been some changes implemented to the CP exam to kind of showcase what's, what's to be expected in the future. One of those changes was a brand new simulation that was introduced in July of this year. It's called a document review simulation, or a DRS. So this will give you an idea of what type of critical thinking skills you're going to be tested on. And the good news is, if you take a review course, uh, you will be covered. We're, we have plenty of questions that mimic the CP exam, and you can practice yourself. Um, so the DRS, really, uh, the idea behind it is that you'll be <clears throat> offered several exhibits. So much like simulating a real-world experience, you are going to have to make a decision on whether the information that you're presented with is important or not important. So you may be given some phone conversation transcripts, some legal letters, authoritative literature, accounts receivable files, or even footnote disclosures. Okay, so you'll have several exhibits to look through. Remember, this is a computerized exam, so you'll go through the different tabs. You'll read everything, you'll come up with your own conclusions, and then you'll be presented a document to edit. And within that document, there will be highlighted sections where you'll basically look at the sentences and say, yes, I agree, I disagree, or I'd like to change it to a different sentence. 
So that just gives you an idea of the new type of questions that will be showing up more and more come the next version of the CPA exam. Now some administrative changes. Um, come Q2 of 2017, the CPA exam will be slightly more expensive, uh, $20 extra, but that, you know, that's because two parts are going to be an hour longer. Um, but some exciting changes are that there will be an official 15 minute break, which is very exciting. Uh, currently on the CP exam, the, the clock just ticks the whole time. If you need to go to the bathroom or take a break, uh, you know, you, there's no pause. So uh, in the future, there will be this 15 minute break. You can't choose when to take it. It's built in and it's going to be right at that halfway mark. So basically after two hours of your exam, uh, which is going to be after your first two testlets of multiple choice questions for all four sections, that's when you're going to have this 15 minute break. You can choose to accept it or not, but we highly recommend that you do take advantage of this break. It's not gonna count against you. And then finally, as Suzanne mentioned, uh, the other big change that just happened a few months ago is that 40 additional testing days added to the CP exam. Um, that change was implemented because many people are trying to get some parts out of the way before the big changes happen and before the exam becomes a little more difficult. So, um, so that's a nice, helpful change there. And this is just a visual for you so you can see. So for those who are going to be able to take the CP exam fairly soon, the next window's coming up in October. So you could take the exam all of October, November, and then December 1st through 10th. After Q4 is Q1 of 2017, you can see January, February, February, and then the first 10 days of March. Q2, as Suzanne mentioned, you can only test in April or May. That blackout month of June is completely you know, non-testable. And then they're gonna bring back the extra 10 days starting Q3 of 2017 and so on. So again, the exam is becoming a little more difficult, but we're gonna prepare you. Any CP review course you take will prepare you and have questions to practice on. And it really is a great move for the accounting industry in general. So with that, I will hand it over to David. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mitra. And Mitra will be available uh, for our Q&A session um, after our presentations are over. So uh, please, um, I encourage you to, to think of any questions you might want to ask her and uh, fire away when the time is ready. So uh, we're going to go ahead and turn it back over to the Board of Accountancy. Uh, up next, we will have uh, Janet Zimmer from the Board of Accountancy, and uh, she'll go ahead and talk about the uh, CPA licensure requirements. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Janet Zimmer, and I'm the Initial Licensing Coordinator with the CBA. I would now like to take some time to talk to you about the requirements to become a CPA and give you a quick walkthrough of what to expect for the initial licensure process. Many of the items I'll be referencing can be found on the CBA homepage under the Applicants tab. Once you've passed the CPA exam, you're one step closer to qualifying for a California CPA license. But it's important to remember that the CPA exam is only one of the core requirements necessary to qualify for a CPA license. In addition, there are education and experience requirements. In all, the CPA exam, education, and experience requirements are commonly referred to as the three E's. Let's first discuss the educational requirements for CPA licensure. Many of you are aware that the educational requirements changed at the beginning of 2014 and another minimal change will occur in 2017. Therefore, you should know that the educational requirements you need to complete for entrance to the CPA exam are not the same as those required to obtain a license. As Suzanne mentioned earlier, the requirements for the CPA exam are a bachelor's degree and 24 semester units each of accounting and business related subjects. In order to qualify for licensure, you must also have a minimum of 150 semester units, which includes the 24-24 requirements, an additional 20 semester units of accounting study, and 10 semester units of ethics study. <coughs> On our website, we have a couple of tip sheets 
2014 and 2017 that will help guide you through understanding the educational requirements. The 2017 tip sheet is what we should be working from today though as it should apply to the majority of current students. Beginning at the top of the tip sheet, the blue font covers the educational requirements for the accounting and business related subjects. These are the same as the 24 semester units each of accounting and business related subjects required to qualify for the CPA exam. The middle area in green covers the 20 semester units of accounting study and the bottom area in the red font covers the 10 semester units of ethics study. Beginning January 1st of 2017, applicants will need to have completed either three semester or four quarter units in accounting ethics or accountants professional responsibilities as part of their 10 semester units ethics requirement. This is an item you'll want to take into consideration, especially if it's your intent to complete all of your education prior to graduation. So what can you do to better understand how your educational qualifications match up with California's requirements? One of the best tools is the self-assessment worksheet available on our website. The instructions will guide you through the process step by step in a very similar process to how we perform the reviews in our office. In addition to the blank worksheet that you can download and fill out, we also have two examples of completed worksheets. Now let's move on to the last of the three E's, experience. To qualify for licensure, you must also complete a minimum of one year of general accounting experience. You can complete your experience requirement in full-time or part-time employment. The experience may be completed from a wide range of activities, including providing any type of service or advice involving the use of accounting, a test, compilation, management advisory, financial advisory, tax, or consulting skills. Additionally, the experience may come from public accounting, private industry, or government. All experience must be completed under the supervision of a licensed CPA. Completion of the general accounting experience requirement will allow you to perform all of the services of a CPA with the exception of signing reports on a test engagements. If you want to sign reports on a test engagements, there's an additional criteria you'll need to complete. You'll need to complete a minimum of 500 hours in a test functions. This minimum of 500 hours must be done under the supervision of a licensed CPA who is authorized to sign reports on a test engagements. For the attest experience requirement, the supervisor will provide an opinion on whether the experience completed has provided you with the ability to plan and conduct a financial statement audit with minimum supervision that results in an opinion on full disclosure of financial statements. Once you've completed the necessary experience, you should have your employer complete the appropriate certificate of experience form and submit it directly to the CBA. It's a good idea to have your experience form signed and submitted to the CBA as you earn it, regardless of whether you're ready to apply or not. Applicants and supervisors change jobs or relocate, and it's sometimes difficult to locate your signer at a later date. But don't worry about whether you intend to apply for licensure right after you've completed your experience. Once we receive your experience forms, we will retain them on file and associate them with your application once it's received. As you prepare to apply for licensure, it's important that you ensure that all the necessary requirements are met in order to have as smooth an experience as possible. There's a checklist on our website that will assist you in understanding all of the items necessary to satisfy the licensure requirements. Applicants who pass the exam in California and have not obtained a license in any other state will apply as a type A candidate. As you can see, in addition to the three E's, there are a couple of other items that you must satisfy in order to obtain licensure. One of the first steps you should take, if you haven't already done so, is to request any additional transcripts that were not submitted during the exam process and have them sent directly to our office. You'll also need to complete a CBA-approved and California-specific ethics examination offered by the California Society of CPAs and commonly referred to as PEF. We've brought up the informational page from Cal CPA's website regarding PETH. It's here you can order the exam, which you can complete online, or request to complete the course via a traditional paper text format. The exam is a self-study exam that will cover a broad range of topics, including the AICPA Code of Professional Conduct and California's Accountancy Act and CBA regulations. CalCPA recommends that you be able to dedicate 16 hours to complete a thorough read of the materials and complete the 50-question final test. 
In order to successfully pass the exam, you'll need to receive a score of at least 90%. Upon successful completion of the exam, CalCPA will send your score to the CPA electronically. Your test results for the PATH exam are valid for two years. If your application is not submitted within 24 months, you'll have to take it again. You'll also need to complete a criminal background history check. This is done by submitting fingerprints to the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice will then complete a background check on both the state and federal level. As a California resident, you'll complete the re fingerprint requirement via LiveScan. Under the Licensing Applicant Forms link on our homepage, you'll find a link to the LiveScan form that you'll need to download and take to an approved LiveScan location. The California Attorney General's website maintains a searchable list of approved LiveScan locations in California. We will receive the information related to your completion of this process electronically from the Department of Justice. Fingerprint, re fingerprint results are valid for only 12 months, though. If your application is not submitted within that 12-month period, you'll have to be reprinted. Once you've satisfied all three E's, fingerprinting, and passed the ethics exam, you're now in a position to apply for a California CPA license. You'll need to provide us with a 2 by 2 inch passport size photo that you'll attach to your application, print the application from our website and mail the completed application and fee to our office along with a completed criminal conviction disclosure form. The criminal conviction disclosure form can be submitted separately or with your application, but it's a commonly overlooked requirement so we recommend you submit it with your application. Once we receive your application, we take steps to keep you informed regarding where you are at in the process. One of the first items you'll receive is an acknowledgement card, which lets you know we've received your application in the initial licensing unit. Staff pull all the available documents to compile your file and will begin our process and perform an initial review of your application. The CBA has a 30-day target processing time frame for initial review of applications. If your file is complete, you'll receive a notification letter informing you that your file has moved on to final review. Once we approve your application, we'll send you a pre-approval letter. The letter will include instructions on next steps, which includes completing an information form and payment of the license fee. Once we receive the completed information form and license fee, we'll send you your final approval letter and large wall certificate, both of which will include your California CPA license number. If your applicant file is incomplete when we do our initial review, you'll receive a status letter detailing any deficiencies with your application and your application is placed in pending status. If it's an educational deficiency, we will send you a copy of the transcripts we had available so you can see how we evaluated it. A 60-day status letter is sent about 30 days after your initial deficiency letter and a new status letter is prepared any time new documentation comes in until your application is complete. There's an average 30-day processing time for all new documentation. It's important that you remember that your application is good for one year from the date we send your initial deficiency letter, after which if you don't complete the deficiencies, your application is abandoned and your fee is forfeited. If your application is abandoned, we will keep your transcripts and experience forms on hand, but you'll need to complete a new application and pay the necessary fee. Additionally, you may also need to undergo fingerprinting again and possibly complete the PATH exam. Just as with the CPA exam process, we have individuals on staff dedicated to assist you with the initial license, licensure process. We also have a tremendous wealth of information available on our website to guide you through the process. Similar to exam, we maintain a handbook specific to the licensure process which will provide you with everything you need to know. We also maintain a series of frequently asked questions that cover all aspects of the licensure requirements and process. This concludes my presentation of the CPA licensure requirements and process. Now I'd like to turn it back to David. Great, thank you very much. Uh, before we move on to the next presenter, I want to go ahead and um, do a shameless plug for our next uh, student event uh, with Mitra Wilson and Roger C.P. Review at uh, Cal State Monterey Bay. This will be on November 16th. And this will be uh, both a webcast uh, format, uh, as you are all watching online, and also a live event um, uh, at, the, at the CSU 
uh, uh, campus right there in Monterey Bay. So uh, we are going to be making the event registration live, so stay tuned for that. Um, the other thing I want to mention as well is that uh, CalCP is currently accepting applications for Campus Ambassador. Uh, so uh, all of the, the details in terms of uh, the Campus Ambassador position is available on our CalCP website. Uh, go, to go, uh, go ahead and go to uh, calcpa.org slash students and you'll be able to navigate to our uh, Campus Ambassador page. Uh, that being said, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Cindy Fuller, uh, and she'll talk about navigating your first licensure renewal. So, Cindy. Thank you, David. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cindy Fuller, and I'm the CBA manager of the License Renewal and Continuing Competency Unit, or more commonly referred to as the Renewal Unit. Once you've earned your CPA license, let's talk about how to navigate your first renewal and maintain it. I do recognize for most of you this time is well into the future, so I won't spend too much time discussing the entire license renewal process and requirements. However, I would like to introduce you to a couple of concepts and terms so when the time comes, it won't feel so unfamiliar. First, your license does expire. And with the exception of your first renewal, this will occur every two years. I say with the exception of your first renewal because your first renewal cycle is calculated in accordance with your birthday and may be prorated. This in turn will prorate the number of continuing education hours, which going forward I'll refer to as CE, required for your first renewal. All of this information will be provided to you upon issuance of your license. Second, you will need to determine whether you want to renew your license as active or inactive. Active requires you to meet and complete certain CE requirements and affords you the ability to continue to provide public accounting services. Please note, any CE taken prior to your license being issued cannot be claimed towards your renewal. Inactive allows you to keep your license current while not completing any CE, but does not allow you to continue to practice public accountancy. Third, when the time comes to renew, the CBA will send you a packet that will guide you through the steps of completing your renewal application. The renewal packet is sent approximately three months prior to your license expiration date to provide you ample time to complete and submit the packet timely. When the time comes to finally renew your hard-earned license, we have several resources on our website that will assist you. One of those items is an overview of the renewal process. This informative and helpful brochure can be located from our website homepage under the Licensees tab. This brochure was developed to provide a quick guide to introducing you to the renewal process. It includes specific CE requirements and information on peer review reporting requirements, both of which are submitted at the time of renewal. For more detailed information, you may refer to the License Renewal Handbook, which is located under the same tab. Another helpful resource under the Licensee section is the License Renewal and Continuing Education link. Here you will find specific information like a CE Quick Reference Guide and information on selecting CE courses, and information on CE Verification, which is our CE Audit Program along with much, much more. Even with all the information available on the website, you may still have questions regarding CE or the renewal process. So please feel free to contact the renewal unit. Our knowledgeable staff will be happy to walk you through the process and answer all your specific questions. This concludes my presentation on the renewal process, and I would like to turn it back over to Mr. Lowe. Thank you for that information, Cindy. Up next, we'll hear from um, Joanna McAvoy, and uh, she is the uh, chair of the Sacramento Chapter YEP Committee, which is our Young and Emerging Professionals, and um, she's also a CPA candidate. And uh, she'll go ahead and share some of her experiences in taking the CPA exam, and um, hopefully you'll be able to, to, to learn a thing or two about uh, what it's like to take the exam. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Joanna. Thank you, David. 
Hi, my name is Joanna McAvoy, and to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, I've been in public accounting for four years now. I did two years in audit and two years in tax, and I would like to tell you a little bit about what it's like to take the CPA exam. Um, the most important thing when you're taking a CPA exam is to uh, give yourself enough time to study. So for each section, you want to um, allocate anywhere from six to eight weeks, especially um, if you're working. If you are waiting to start your new job, you can actually um, study in a shorter amount of time. Most people, I think, pass uh, within six to nine months for the whole exam. However, if you have busy season at work, you will most likely take longer. Um, once you pass your first exam, you have 18 months to uh, complete the full exam. Um, you can pay for your exams all at once or pay as you go. I think if you're working and you have a busy season, it's best to pay two exams um, at once. That way you have more time to take the exam. But the key thing to pass your exam is um, allocate enough time to study every day. So if you can dedicate anywhere from an hour to four hours a day to um, study, uh, that would be the best. And they advise to study for about 100 hours per each section. Um, and life ha does happen when you can't study for one night and you have to take a night off, but most of the time you will have to um, cancel all your social plans and just actually focus and study. Um, really important thing when you're trying to pass the exam is to get the CPA review course and you want to make sure you finish it. The CPA review courses include um, reading uh, your whole book, uh, listening to lectures, doing all the multiple choice uh, problems and task-based simulations. Um, and you want to make sure you actually complete the whole book in about four weeks and then you leave last two weeks for review. Um, during the review process you want to do uh, your multiple choice questions all over again, redo uh, um, all the task-based simulations, reread the book, and that way you're prepared for the exam. Another way to review is also uh, make an outline of each chapter. Um, a lot of people who are working in public accounting uh, will take the exam on Monday and will take a whole week off right before the exam to actually be able to prepare and study. Um, night before the exam, um, you want to just make sure you get enough sleep because you want to be all rested, um, all ready for the next day. Um, during the day of the exam, uh, you want to arrive early and eat some good, a big lunch before because you'll be stuck in that room for four hours and um, it would be really, would be really long day if you don't um, get some, um, if, you're, if you're hungry. Um, after your, your exam, Usually you feel pretty confused on if you passed or not, and especially that you don't find out for another couple of weeks, um, you want to make sure you start studying for your next section pretty much right away. And keep in mind that um, about half of the candidates, unfortunately, uh, will have to retake the exam. And but retaking the exam means that you have to restudy a whole book and retake the questions, um, redo the notes, so make sure you give it your 100% the first time so you don't have to repeat it. And um, my last advice is just never give up. Thank you. And um, David will take some of the questions. Thanks. Great. great. Thank you so much, Joanna, for sharing your uh, experiences. Definitely uh, some great tips there for taking the CPA exam. Um, so now, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, reserve the rest of our time here for uh, Q&A. So we have um, representatives from the Board of Accountancy as well as Mitra Wilson uh, from Roger CPA Review joining us uh, from uh, her office in uh, San Francisco. So we'll go ahead and turn over to questions and I believe, um, so go ahead and, and type those in. We'll go ahead and get to as many questions as we can. Uh, so we'll go ahead and start with um, our first question and I'll go ahead and go off camera. And 
have a first question here. Let's go ahead and sit down. Oh, sure. All right. I'll sit down here. That makes it easier. Uh, this is from Sarah Pitt. Uh, the, the question is, during my interview process, employees were telling me that it takes two years of work experience to earn a CPA license. But I'm, I'm hearing from your presentation that it should only take one year, slash 12 months. Um, how should I respond to firms that insist on two years before signing off? The California Board of Accountants, you only requires 12 months of general accounting experience. Some firms do have internal policies that require longer. Um, that is completely up, completely up to you if you decide to work for that type of firm or not. Um, those are the types of questions anybody should be asking when they go in for those interviews is, <coughs> A, will you sign it after 12 months? And, and B, do you have a licensed CPA with an active, valid license who will be eligible to sign it at the end of, of that period of time? It's perfectly reasonable for you to make your needs of, um, apparent when you're applying for that job so that they know right up front what you're looking to get out of it. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Mitra. Hi. Did you have anything to add to that? or? Okay. <laughs> I'll go ahead and uh, wait for more questions. Mitra, can you hear us? Hello. Excuse us while we have some technical issues that we're trying to deal with here. I'm trying to see if there's any questions coming in online here. Um, I'm not seeing come th anything come through right now. Um. You have uh, another question from Donna. Okay. Um, I'm not sure it's pulling up here. Let me. Uh, okay, here. I see it now. Uh, this is from Donna Medina. Hi, Donna. Uh, my name is Donna. I'm a junior in college and would like to begin studying for the CPA exam in January to take it in January 2018. Is it too early? So um, I'll kind of throw it out to both. Uh, well, let's have the Board of Accountancy maybe kind of weigh in on that, on that and then we'll have Mitra uh, weigh in as well. So what are, what are your thoughts? Um, you know, honestly, I don't think it's ever too early to prepare for the CPA exam. Um, I, I don't know if uh, Mitra has any other <laughs> recommendations. Um, you're really early in the process, but, uh, you know, starting early will never hurt. Sure. Um, Mitra, uh, I'm not sure if you heard the question, but uh, Donna is a junior in college and would like to begin studying for the CPA exam in January uh, to take it in January 2018, and, and she's wondering if it's too early to, to start studying. Can okay. I also add one, one more thing? Sure, um, please. I, I know some of the CPA review courses have certain materials that are based on the year that they take the exam. So that might be something you want to take into consideration um, when you are studying for the exam. Okay. Uh, hi, Mitra. Can, can you hear us now? I can. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Um, we had a question from Donna, and she was uh, a cur she's a, currently a junior in college, and she's planning to start studying for the CPA exam in January to take it in January 2018, so a full year before she plans to uh, take the exam. She's wondering if it's too early or not. Well, any thoughts on that from your end? So January 2017? Uh, yeah, yeah. She's going to start studying in January 2017 to take it in uh, January correctly? 2018. Uh-oh. Hi, Mitra. Studying in January 2017 to take the exam in January 2018. Oh, okay. okay. Um, <coughs> generally, it, it, it kind of depends. depends. Normally, people, people don't, don't start, start that, that early on um, because retention rates go down. You have to think about that. We've done all types of research, and even for 
the section that people tend to say takes the most time, and even with our review course, you get the most, you know, uh, chapters in the book, most lecture time, would be FAR, financial accounting and reporting. Even for a section like that, people tend to take somewhere between two to three months at the most for just that one section. So starting the study too early poses a few issues. A, um, are you even qualified to sit for the CPA exam yet? If not, then you're really just kind of reviewing topics and know that every six months, new pronouncements are added to the CPA exam. Things are changing. That's what's great about having an online course like ours. We're able to keep up with those changes in real time. So something you may study a year in advance most likely will show up on the CP exam, but it may change as well. So um, you have to keep that in mind. It's better to be fresh with what you're studying and take it soon after. Does that make sense? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mitra. Okay. <laughs> All right. We have a, a, a question. I think uh, we'll, we'll stick with Mitra here uh, from Nick. And he's, asked, he, he's asking if it's appropriate to ask for reimbursement for a, re, a, re, a, a review course and testing fees from a, an employer. So we'll go to Mitra and then we'll ask the, the Board of Accountancy as well. Yeah, I mean, that's very common, actually. A lot of firms out there do offer incentives to take the CP exam. They want to move you up more quickly within the firm. Uh, so getting that you know, CP licensure is a win-win for everybody. So I think it's totally appropriate to ask because it is often common practice to either at least cover exam fees, um, but also maybe partial uh, amount of a CP review course or the full thing, or some firms will just offer you a bonus once you pass the actual CP exam. So it's kind of payment after the fact, but that's really great incentive. And many of them do give a timeline Maybe you have to pass it within the first year of your start date or second year. Um, but it is common practice nowadays. Uh, private industry and government agencies kind of have different policies, but um, definitely within public accounting, I think it's totally fine to ask. What about fees uh, paid for licensure and asking for reimbursement? No, I think it's the same with the CBA fees. It is common practice that some firms do reimburse their um, employees with the application fees. It's different um, from firm to firm if they do it or not. I know there are some that will pay for your first try at the section, <laughs> um, but it's, it's the same. Um, there are some reimbursement options depending on what firm you're employed with. Okay, oh, that'll help. Um, we'll, we'll stay here with the CBA, and uh, we have a question here. Um, how long does it take to hear uh, if I can take, this, take the exam um, in terms of qualifications? With a fully completed application, so this means we have your application, your fee, and all of your transcripts. We try to uh, review your file within 30 days. Okay, great. And let's see. We'll take a, a question from, from Patty Stevens here. Uh, please explain what are, what are the criteria a, a licensed CPA, non-public, uh, for example, a financial controller of an organization, can they be eligible to sign off uh, on experience as, uh, for a candidate? We, we do accept experience from um, private industry or government. Private, public, the difference is um, public accounting is an accounting firm. Private accounting is if you work in the accounting department for a different type of company like Sony or Disney, something like that. Um, as long as the person who signs your form has regular review of your work, has authority over you, and has an active valid license, they're eligible to sign the form. We frequently get experience forms from private companies, from government entities. Okay, great. And... Let's see. Um, okay, we have a question here coming from, I guess, the, uh, the if, if you didn't know, the, the CBA is also webcasting, so we're getting some questions in from the, 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 the CBA webcast here. Uh, I have a question here. It says, um, I'm in a program that gives me a bachelor's to master's degree at the same time. When can I take the exam? Thank you. 
So if you are in a dual program like that, um, where you do not get the degree or bachelor degree conferred until you complete your master's degree requirements, um, you can still take the CP exam before then. Um, you would need to provide some letter from your school, uh, generally the registrar's office, that indicates you are in, enrolled in this type of program. Um, there's details that it needs to state um, things like that you're in good standing, that you've completed all of your bachelor's, bachelor's requirements as of this date, and the only reason why you did not um, have your bachelor's degree conferred on your transcript was because you are in this program, and it will not be conferred until you receive your master's degree. Okay, so just getting some something from the school. Right. Okay. And there's, there's uh, detailed information on what that letter needs to state on our website. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, throw a question over to Mitra's uh, area here. Um, <laughs> I, I guess this person joined late, so I apologize. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the changes to the exam? I guess maybe kind of a, I know Mitra, you, you went through a whole great presentation about that, but maybe just kind of a, 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 a quick snapshot in terms of what, what's different. And I would also encourage that person who's, who's watching to sign up for our webcast um, uh, on, on the actual changes to the exam uh, coming up on November 16th with, with Roger CP Review. So you know, she'll, she'll go more in depth in terms of the actual changes, but maybe just kind of a high level view just, uh, just for um, our purposes here. Amitra? Sure. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, on November 16th, I'll, I'll definitely go into much more detail because um, there's a lot of strategy involved. But basically, the big changes is that we're going to take away from just the basic memorization type questions, multiple choice, a lot of them remembering and understanding, and move towards more of the critical thinking type questions. We're really tr trying to get the you know first and second level new hire accountants ready for those critical thinking skills that are needed on the job. So a lot less multiple choice questions and much more task-based simulation problems that simulate real world scenarios. Uh, so BEC, for example, is gonna be the section that will change the most. Currently, it's just made up of multiple choice and three essays, written communication. But starting quarter two of 2017, it will also have those task-based simulations. So that just gives you an idea of what's to come. Um, there's also going to be built-in 15-minute break, which is exciting because currently now the clock just ticks and there is no pause. Um, and there are a few other logistical changes that I will discuss in the future. Sure. Great. Thank you, Mitra. Um, we have a question here from Jennifer Owens. Hi, my name is Jennifer. Can you please elaborate on the new ethics educational requirement for 2017? I see that, that the tip sheet describes accounting ethics or accountants' professional responsibilities. What courses might satisfy this requirement? So, CBA. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, what it is is from within your 10 semester unit requirement for ethics, you have to have a minimum of either three semester units or four quarter units in a course that is devoted to accounting ethics or accountants professional responsibilities. Unlike the other um, courses that we accept for ethics, this one is not title specific. So we are able to look at um, course descriptions from your course catalog or your syllabus. Um, this is especially important for people who might have gone to school overseas or um, in another state. A lot of schools in California have switched over and they are, they're incorporating a class that's specifically titled accounting ethics or accountants professional responsibilities. But if you went to a school that doesn't have that, we will take a look at the course description, but it's a good idea to include a cover letter with a copy of that course description when you submit your application so that we know which course you want us to look at for that. But what we're going to be looking at is that the course um, content specifically addresses accounting ethics, not just an ethics course, not just a business ethics course, but it has to be about accounting. Great. We'll stay here with the CBA, and uh, we have a question coming in from the CBA's webcast. Um, if I complete my bachelor's but don't have all the courses required, where can I take the rest of the, the necessary courses? 
Um, for exams or licensing, um, we accept transcripts from any institution that is accredited either regionally or nationally and has the ability to grant a degree. That includes online schools, community colleges, um, overseas schools have to go through the uh, foreign, eventual creden or foreign credential evaluation service um, route, um, but we uh, will accept transcripts from a, a, a wide variety of places. Okay, great. Um, we have a question for, um, for, from a Roger CPA student, actually. Um, for Roger CPA students, will they be getting the new updated material if they purchase a review course in the last few months for free, or will it be discounted at all? At all? Um, yes. So we will be switching things over closer to the end of the year. Their student will be studying for the next version of the CP exam. Um, like I mentioned, since it's an online course, we're able to do that in real time. We will give you warnings, of course, um, and it's it's for free. So um, you do have an option if you wanted to purchase a brand new textbook at a discounted rate, if you'd like. But either way, we always have updated PDF chapters ready to go for you on your student online account. Okay. So you will be well prepared. Good to know. Thank you, Mitra. Um, we have a question from Jessica uh, Susanto. I apologize if I, I butchered your name. Um, I, will need, uh, I will need to wait until I'm qualified for a degree before asking for evaluations by the CBA, right? Uh, since I'm graduating this December, um, do I still need to wait for the evaluations prior to taking the exam? Isn't it going to be impossible to pass the exam before Q2? Hi, Jessica. Um, I'll, I'll just speak to what the requirements are. I kind of wasn't completely um, understanding of the, the, the question about the Q2 part. But I do want to say that you do have to have a bachelor's degree prior to being approved for the exam. So if you do not meet the minimum qualifications, um, you will not be approved unless you are in one of those dual programs that I mentioned earlier, uh, where you're, you'll be uh, receiving the bachelor's degree at the time you receive your master's degree. Staying with the CBA here, uh, does the CBA pre-approve or evaluate transcripts before I apply for licensure? I'm sorry, we do not pre-approve uh, transcripts, courses. Um, all of that will be done at the time we review your file. Um, we do have to have your official transcripts in order to perform the review. Okay. Um, we have a question from Lazaro Perez. Hi, my name is Lazaro. My question is, Am I able to start my work experience for the CPA requirements under a licensed CPA while I'm still in college? Absolutely. Um, the experience can be earned before, during, after your exam process. It can be done as a volunteer, as an internship. It can be done for multiple employers. Um, we'll just take your multiple experience forms and look at it and composite. Um, but it can be done at any point in time. At the time you apply for licensure, we look for either your experience or your exam scores to have been completed within the last five years so that we know your knowledge is current. Um, if in s occasional circumstances both of them are older than five years, there's still a pathway for you too. There's just extra steps. Great. Um, we have a question here that uh, for Mitra here um, from Carol Cox. Uh, Hi, I understand the current exam contains about 10% uh, IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards related questions. Will this percent increase in 2017 or 2018? Thank you. That's a great question, Carol. Um, <clears throat> from what we've seen from the AICPA, what they've shared with us, um, it, it's going to stay around that, that same amount. So it's not really tested in the regulation section, but in the other sections you will see it. Um, back to the CBA here. Uh, we have a question coming in from their webcast. Uh, can I start taking my CE, continuing education, before I get my license? I actually get that question a lot in the initial licensing unit. 
um, you don't want to take CE until your license is actually issued. Not a single unit of uh, hour of CE will count towards your first renewal until after your license number has been issued. Uh, staying here with the CBA, uh, another question here. If I get my general license, can I go back and obtain a, the, the, attest license? the attest license? I guess, yeah. Yes, you can. Okay. Um, a lot of people um, start out with just the, the basic 12 months general experience. They get a general license, and then at any point in time, um, as long as your license is still um, in valid, good standing, you can submit an attest acknowledgement form with a $25 fee and um, a, a certificate of attest experience that documents that 500 hours of attest. Um, it takes about 30 days, when we, um, but we process those in the initial licensing unit. You can do it at any point in time. Okay. Uh, this question is for, for Mitra. I think she'd probably be the best person to answer this. Um, do you have any stories uh, that you can share about people who have decided to become a CPA later in life? Not necessarily right out of college or in their 20s, but and how did they get s started and stick with the process all the way through? I assume they would be Roger students or whatever, uh, going through that whole process yeah. of preparing. That, that's a great question. Um, we have plenty of stories. <laughs> Uh, you know, we've seen so many people who maybe decide to take a different career right out of college and years later decide, you know what, I really want to pursue accounting instead and come back. And that's what's so important about taking a review course is we assume, you know, nothing. And Roger always jokes that he's rarely disappointed. <laughs> uh, but the point is, everyone's at a different levels, um, you know. You may be a fresh graduate. You may have not taken an accounting class for years. Um, you may be in a very niche type of accounting um, or very broad. So everyone is all over the place, really. So we have to start from scratch. We really teach you the basics and go from there. And that's really important. Um, the CP exam, it's not an IQ test. It really is more about time management and discipline and motivation. So as long as you have those, um, really, if you study, you will pass. Those are really key with the CP exam, almost more than, than knowing the topics. So there's been some really inspirational stories uh, of people coming back into the industry, and I highly recommend you check out our blog. We have a student of the month series every month that we like to highlight, and we're all, always highlighting unique stories like that. So check it out. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mitra. Thank you, Mitra. Um, um, we have, uh, we have a, question, uh, a question from, uh, from Rita uh, Munir, uh, who is, uh, shout out to Rita. She's our um, Sacramento State campus ambassador, so hello. Um, Rita asks, for the CPA exam, does the for do foreign units or units that have not been accepted, I guess, as transfer units by the university um, count towards 150 for the CPA exam? Um, if you have foreign units that you want considered towards the 150 unit requirement, um, you'll have to have them submitted through a foreign credential evaluation service, have the evalu evaluation sent to us. Um, if they're already counted on your U.S. school transcript, then we just accept them as transfer units. Um, but if we end up with the the U.S. school transcript and the foreign evaluation, um, and one of them has higher units for those transfer units, we'll take the higher amount. Okay. Makes sense. Um, we have a question here from the CBA webcast. Uh, if I take classes, or if I take a class that fulfills two different requirements, can it both, uh, can it count toward both? Sort of. Um, we don't double count any courses. So if you took a three semester unit auditing course, for example, auditing can be accepted towards accounting, business, or ethics requirements. Um, but we always allocate towards the course subject requirements first, and then the accounting study, and then the ethics. So if you needed it for accounting, that's where we would count it. If you didn't need it for accounting and you needed it for business, that's where it would go next. And then if you didn't need it for either of those, then we would count it for your, your, your ethics requirement. Um, but we will allow you to split units. So if you needed one of those to meet the accounting unit requirement and the other two were free, we could count those two in your ethics requirement. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question here from Daniel uh, Kirtley. 
Daniel asks, I was just hired uh, at a firm and started this week. Congratulations. Uh, I worked there already as part time, uh, as a part time intern, eight hours a week for four months. Can those four months be counted towards the one year of experience required? And um, and if I and if not, do I have to wait a full year to apply uh, for the exam? You you don't have to finish your experience before you can take the exam. That's not one of the requirements to sit for the exam. Um, you do have to finish it before you're ready for licensure, obviously. Um, did he say he was working full-time or uh, part-time? He, he, was, he was working part-time, okay. so now he's working full-time. So, uh, and we accept both. Um, for part-time uh, periods of employment on the experience form, there's a section for full-time and a section for part-time. So they would list the four months of part-time with the number of hours you worked during those four months. And we give you one month credit for every 170 part-time hours you worked. And then when you started working full-time, they'd have a date range there as well. So we'd calculate your full-time hours or full-time period of employment into months, and then we would add um, the calculated part-time hours as well. Okay, great. Um, we have a question here uh, from Jessica, uh, Susanto again. Is, fraud is our fraud examination class uh, does it qualify as an accounting ethics course? Yes, it does. Okay, simple enough. All right. We don't pre-qualify any courses. We get a lot of questions by email, phone call, does this class count as this, does this count, count as that? And the standard answer you'll get from any staff member is that we can't pre-qualify any courses. But a good rule of thumb is that tip sheet. We use that as a, a, a guide in our unit. So under ethics, if it says the word fraud or audit or accounting, uh, not accounting, if it says fraud or audit or ethics in the title of your course, those are clear indicators for ethics, so those would count for those sections. Okay, great. Um, we're waiting some f for more things to come in, but I guess maybe a question that I've, I've had students ask me, um, you know, what, what are some of the, the I guess the, 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 the common mistakes that people make when they're, when they're applying for licensure? What are, the, what are the, some, some of the glaring things that you see? Are they leaving certain things out or just, you know, what, what, in your experience, what, what, what has that been like for you in terms of what some, some things that... Let's start with yeah. exams. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, um, as I mentioned earlier, I do think our most, most, most common <laughs> um, deficiency is the degree is not posted on the transcript. Mm. Um, and this is mainly because they've graduated, they're excited to take this EPA exam, and they want to apply tomorrow. <laughs> um, so a lot of schools do take um, quite a bit of time to get that degree posted on your transcript. Um, so we do recommend to talk to your um, records office and please check to determine when that degree is going to be posted on the transcript before you have it um, sent over to us. That's our number one uh, deficiency. Sure. Um, ours, uh, surprisingly, people forget to sign their application, and we'll send it back. Um, oh, wow. okay. You also have to sign the criminal conviction disclosure form. People forget that one because it's only really listed on the materials checklist, um, but it's important to fill that one out. Um, the, the ethics exam, um, when we get them from Cal CPA, they list your name, the address you provided Cal CPA, the date you took, the date you passed the exam, and the score that you got. But in order for us to associate that with your file, that the name and the address need to match the name and an address somewhere in your application. And so if it doesn't, that'll, that'll prompt a deficiency. It's really easy to clear up if you get that letter. Just give us a call and tell us the name you prov or the address you provided. But changing your address with Cal CEPA will not help because they don't send it to us again. Okay. So make sure you, you contact somebody at our office to, to clear that up. Sure, sure. Can I add one more thing? Yeah. Um, th this is general among all three of our units. That's been happening lately as well. Um, if you do not sign your check for your applications, <laughs> it will get returned to you. Um, it does happen. Um, everything gets returned to you. You have to resend it with a signed check, um, and the clock starts over for you. So that's, that's how I buy time on. Please on do not rent. forget to sign forget, your check. Convenient, forget to sign that, and then you know it buys me a couple of days. So. Um, let me let me throw a question out to, to Mitra here. Um, 
you know, there's, I, I encounter some students that, that want to work a couple more years before taking the exam. They want to delay. You know, what's in your in your professional experience? You know, what? How do you how do you counsel um, CPA candidates that, that want to kind of delay it a little bit on, on taking the exam? And and what, what's your view on that? Um, we tend to not recommend it, <laughs> and uh, neither does the AICPA. I mean, again, we we've, we've done tons of research. And we found that the average pass rates do go down the longer you wait between graduation and taking the CPA exam. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people think, you know what, let me start work, let me dive in, learn some of the practical stuff first, and then I can apply it on the CPA exam. But, you know, not everything is going to overlap is the problem. So um, a lot of auditors, for example, will say, you know what, let me let me get some real world knowledge first and then I'll do really well on the audit exam. And ironically enough, uh, they tend to do the worst <laughs> on the audit exam. And I think that's because they don't put in the real study hours and they don't take it maybe as seriously as they should because they figure they have the real world experience to rely on. Um, so, you know, this it, it's still a lot of theory based, this exam. Um, a lot of it's just learning those important test taking skills as well, which is why it's important with the review course to learn those tips and tricks along the way um, as well. So, you know, we recommend you take the exam as soon as possible after graduation. This way, what you learned in school is still fresh. You know, your intermediate accounting classes, cost accounting class, your tax, your audit, all that information is going to overlap with the CPA exam. So that's the best way. Obviously, if that's not the route you can take, then, you know, that's fine. But that's what we recommend. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question mm -hmm. that, that's coming from uh, Elizabeth Levin. Um, and she asks, why are people who come from other bachelor's degrees allowed to take the CP exam? Is there any limitation on which type of bachelor's? Um, there's no limitation on the bachelor's degree. You can, we, we frequently get people who came from a, a psychology back, a bachelor's degree or a science bachelor's degree, engineering bachelor's degree, a lot of management bachelor's degrees, um, but they still have to meet the core subject requirements. So they'll end up with a lot more education because they go back to school and they get that 24 semester units of accounting for exams and then the extra six units that you require for licensure. Um, we're not, we're not specific about what your bachelor's degree right. is in as long as you have one. <laughs> right. And, and, and to that question too, you, you'll, you'll have folks who already have, have attained a bachelor's degree, um, you know, in political science and they go ahead and go to UCLA Extension and do their, their, their coursework there, mm -hmm. uh, fulfill those requirements and that qualifies them to, to take, take the CPA exam. So they'll probably submit an application with 225 mm -hmm you know, units or something like that, because it's just, there's just so many units, right? I, uh, I approved one today that had 290 total semester units. Well, there you go. Seven, <laughs> seven different schools. Wow. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, geez. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm still waiting for some more questions to come in. And I think, what about, licensure renewal and kind of tracking your your um your ces how does that you know what what, what tips do you have for people who, who just got licensed and they're and they're starting to navigate that whole ce process now to try to keep up with continuing ed and you know what what have you seen in terms of maybe common mistakes of first-time licensure renewal the most common mistake is that they are reporting ce that was taken before licensure ah uh, okay um we, the CBA doesn't track your CE for you, mm. so it is your responsibility to um, keep track of your own CE and submit it at the time of renewal. And that's the only time we are informed of when your CE is taken. Right. Okay. Keep on that. I mean, accounting students, you guys all work on Excel, so you should probably just <laughs> kind of, you know, notate, you know, keep a keep record on Excel probably. Um, so... I think I'm not seeing any new questions come in uh, from our audience now. No? 
I don't. Um, Mitra, what's, uh, I'll, I'll throw a question out about the CPA exam. Um, in your experience, how often are those, uh, is the exam kind of recalibrated or, 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 or kind of refreshed? Um, you know, it seems that uh, maybe in, there might have been something happening in, in 20, 2012, 2013 or something like that, but then now you have 2017 coming. Are there just going to be more iterations? Like, you know, in 2020, they might have another version of that or... You know what's that whole thinking behind behind AICPA and when, when they when they kind of redo a, a an exam and, and and kind of restructure it? Yeah, um, I mean generally there won't be major changes for several years. Um, this this is going to be the biggest revamp of the CPA exam. Uh, you know the 2017 version starting April 1st in over a decade. So this is definitely. The biggest one because everything is changing the timing the structure um, some of the content um, but you know there are new topics that are brought to the cp exam pretty regularly so again about every six months a new pronouncement will be introduced um, last year the big thing was the audit section introduced the clarity standards for example or several years ago the big thing was ifrs the international international financial reporting standards so it is an ever evolving exam, which is exciting because we want to keep up with the industry um, and globalization, especially. But you probably won't see any major changes like the ones we're going to see in 2017 for at least, you know, five more years. This is a big deal and it's taken um, a lot of time and effort to come up with this new version. Sure. Um Sticking with you, and, and this should be an easy question. Do my uh, we have a question coming in from the CBA webcast here? Uh, do my exam scores ever expire? Um, so that should be kind of a neat. So well, why don't you take that, Mitra, as well, since you're here? <laughs> they don't expire. They don't expire. There you go. Um, but <laughs> yeah, there you go. You passed. You passed. I actually had a, um, to answer that person's question too. Um, I, I, I was we were volunteering uh, as Cal CPA staff, and there was a, a fellow volunteer there. Um, she passed the CPA exam in 1982, all four sections, and she asked about, uh, and and she found out that I work for Cal CPA, and uh, and I said, well, why don't you? Hey, yeah, she's nearing. She maybe has another three or four years in her career, and she's like, you know, I've never gotten licensed. I'm like, well, those scores are still good. Right. You still you just you know you you got to do the path exam. Uh, there's there's some new things here, but uh, and she does have the 150 units as well. Uh, that, 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 um, in addition, she has a master's degree, so uh, that may or may not apply because she's been licensed so I mean passed the exam for such such a long time ago. But um, but it, it's, it it never goes away. 1982, it's still good. So I, I can actually do you one better than that. <laughs> um, Early this year, we licensed somebody who passed the exam in 1972. <laughs> we had to find his exam scores. Oh, wow. Um, but our records retention goes back a long way. So good. we found him and we licensed him. He was in his late 70s. Oh, good for and him. And he worked for a firm doing taxes all these years. <laughs> and um, finally, his partner wanted to retire. So he needed to have his own license. So yes. we got him licensed. and, and um, 1972. They don't expire in California, but that is not the case all across the United States. Oh, so okay. some other states where you take it, they do have um, a requirement that you apply for the license within a certain number of years, but not in California. Okay, great. Um, we have a question here, and we'll stick with the CBA here. Um, I passed the exam in a different state, but want to be licensed in California. Can I transfer my scores? Probably. Um, if you passed the exam in another state um, and you're not licensed anywhere, then you're going to apply to us as a type B applicant. And type B applicants, in order for us to accept your grades from the other state, you have to have qualified to sit for the exam in the other state under our, the same requirements California has, the same standards. So you had to have your bachelor's degree conveyed 24 semester units in accounting and 24 semester units in business related subjects prior to the first date you took the exam. And you have to have passed that exam within an 18 month window. Mm -hmm. Some states allow you a little bit more time from like the first day that you passed it until the end of the 18th month. And in those cases, we can't accept those grades. 
So it's important if you took it somewhere else that you look to make sure that you're going to meet those type B requirements. Sure. Um, we have a, uh, a question here from Michael Lee. Um, and I'll, I'll throw this out to Mitra. Uh, how many times can a candidate take the exam? Um, technically, you can take it as many times as you need to. Um, the only catch is if you don't pass a section, you cannot retake that same section in that same testing window. So you will have to wait until the following testing window to retake it. Um, but what we recommend is to do that, especially if you're only you know, 5 to 15 points away. It's very common to be in that low 70s, unfortunately. I know it's very frustrating because all you need is that 75 to pass. Uh, but if, you know, if you're in that range, rather than move on to another section and study for that and take it in the next window, if you're able to, sometimes timing doesn't work out, but if you're able to, you can push back the exam that you're planning on taking next and reschedule the one that you just didn't pass by a few points because the information's still fresh. You're not going to forget everything. And really all that means is you just need extra reinforcement. You need to go over the, the software, you know, interactive questions. And you need to refresh yourself with some of the lectures and the topics and just retake it. So that's a little strategy right there. Have you ever encountered, Have you ever encountered anybody, anybody that's, that's that taken like two exams in one testing window? They'll take like far B, C in one testing window? Is that even possible? Um, um, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we have students who do an accelerated program with us in three months. We have different study planners. We offer a three, six, nine, and 12-month plan. Okay. It's just okay. a suggested guide, but it's really nice because it gives you a, a real realistic view of what you're getting yourself into. And some students, you know, they graduate and maybe they don't start work for several months. So, if you have nothing going on, you know, you're not studying, you're not um, at work yet, yeah, you can take all four in one testing window. We have plenty of students who pass with flying colors to do that. Well, others have a lot going on in their lives and, and they need to take a full 18. So it really depends on you. But the nice thing is most review courses will offer some type of a study plan that you can look at and see which one fits your actual schedule. Sure. Uh, we have another question coming in here. Uh, my experience is over five years. Um, will it still count? I, I assume work experience. So right. it was achieved five if years ago. Or if more. your experience is more than five years old, as long as you passed the exam within the last five years, just the last section within the last five years, then that's not a problem. We'll take both of them. But if for some reason your exam scores and your experience were both over five years old, then once your application is complete otherwise, um, we may ask you to do 80 hours of continuing education. That's just for licensure, and it wouldn't, none of that would count towards your first renewal. Sure. Um, we have another question coming here from online. Did I hear correctly, if I received my bachelor's degree in another state, I would still need to apply for licensure as a B-type applicant in California? No. Um, you can go to school wherever you want to. Um, if you took all four um, CPA exams in another state, mm. then you would apply to us as a type B applicant. Okay. Just the exam then? Yes. Okay. Um, this question is for Mitra uh, from Michael Lee here. Um, Mitra, what are the average number of study hours a student should, I guess, uh, dedicate to in order to, to success successfully complete the CPA exam? Um, I know you have different study models, right, study plans, so maybe you can give us an overview as to what, you, I guess, it, it, the hours you dedicate will be contingent upon whatever plan you're on. Right. Um, yeah, a, a good rule of thumb, though, um, and, you know, we work very closely with the AICPA, the people who create the CPP exam, is overall you're, you're going to be spending about three to 400 hours studying for all four parts of the CPA exam. And, you know, that includes watching the lectures, reading the homework books and the textbooks, doing all the practice questions, and then, of course, doing, like, a CP exam simulator, like we have, uh, several weeks before your actual exam date that spits out um, an exam-like scenario, four hours. You want to sit there and really just go through it as if you're sitting at the Prometrics testing centers. Um, you want to get used to kind of having that stamina. So... 
three to 400 hours is what they recommend. And I will say that with our course and, and many others, you should definitely do your research. The one section that tends to take the most study time is FAR, financial accounting and reporting. Um, I believe with our, our course, it's about 120 hours total um, of study time for just that section, where when you look at another section like BEC, um, it's, it's much less. It's more around the 70 hour range um, because it just requires less information to be covered. Now, the times are going to change a little bit come quarter two of 2017 with an addition of an hour in regulation and an hour in BEC. So that's something that I'm going to cover heavily uh, in our webcast with Cal CPA on November 16th because that's a that's a hot topic and everyone want, wants to know how to adjust their study time. All right. Well, you heard, you heard the plug from, from Mitra, so d definitely join us on November 16th uh, online or in, live in person. Um, that being said, I don't think we're having any more questions come in currently for the Board of Accountancy or, or Roger CPA Review. So um, the Board of Accountancy does have uh, uh, an email, right? Licensing info mm -hmm. at uh, cba.gov. Um, I, uh, or, I'm sorry, <laughs> I should probably know this, the, but you should probably know this. For the licensing this. unit, yes. it's licensinginfo at cba.ca.gov. All right. For the exams unit, it's examinfo at cba.ca.gov. Right. Yeah. Uh, but definitely uh, 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 forward your, your questions, uh, either about the exam uh, or the licensure uh, pro uh, uh, questions to, to those email addresses. Um, I, I personally can attest to the responsiveness, uh, responsiveness of the CBA. I, I've, had, I've had students, I've directed them to email uh, both, both uh, email addresses and they've gotten um, some great responses, so we definitely appreciate that. Um, with that being said, I, I want to thank you, thank the CBA for, for being here tonight. Um, we'll go ahead and, and um, conclude this portion uh, and we'll go ahead and um, conclude with some closing remarks from um, from our Sacramento chapter vice president. So uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Thank you very much, um, speakers. Fantastic job. Uh, on behalf of the Sacramento chapter of Cal CPA, I want to thank all of the webcast attendees for participating in our event this evening. We hope you found the information helpful as you consider whether to become a CPA. I also want to encourage students that are not currently members of Cal CPA to join our organization and become active in their local chapter. Again, membership for students is free. If you are in the Sacramento region, I invite you to join us at our student outreach luncheon on November 10th at Sac State University, where you will have the opportunity to hear from and interact with practitioners working in various aspects of the profession. Thank you again for your interest in the CPA profession, and we wish you a great evening. Thank you. Uh, my thanks to uh, the California Board of Accountancy for joining us tonight for this webcast. My, uh, my thanks to Mitra Wilson and Roger CPA Review uh, for joining us as well um, and sharing their uh, knowledge about the new upcoming CPA exam. Uh, I invite you to join us on November 16th uh, at Cal State Monterey Bay and also online. Um, We'll be posting the event uh, next week, so go ahead and, and um, if you're a Cal CPA student member, you'll be receiving an email about that, uh, so you can go ahead and register. Uh, the event will be complimentary, uh, sponsored by, by Cal CPA, um, and uh, it'll be posted on our student page, which is calcpa.org slash students. So uh, have a good evening. Thank you so much for joining us.